We've been discussing beginning last week with uh, our desire to be fulfilled in life, to not be empty, to not feel like there's something lacking, something missing in our life. And we're exploring whether or not it is true, and I believe that it is, um, that that feeling of fulfillment can only come from living by God's Word. We ended in Hebrews chapter 3, and that's where we'll pick it up if you will turn uh, in your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. The writer of Hebrews warns <clears throat> against the, the dangers of unbelief. And it's not talking necessarily about not believing in God or not believing in Jesus, uh, but, but, but unbelief by our actions, unbelief by the way that we live. In choosing to sin and choosing to ignore God's commandments and choosing to go our own way, that is a, a sign of unbelief. <clears throat> now, the, the authorship of Hebrews is somewhat disputed. For, for a while, it was believed that Paul wrote it, uh, then Origen and some other early church fathers disputed that and, and said that it's not consistent with Pauline epistles and said that maybe Barnabas, one of his uh, uh, people that had traveled with him on his, some of his missionary jer uh, journeys as the author, the book itself doesn't indicate uh, necessarily who the author is. But you, it is uh, one thing that is for sure is that the book is written to the Jews, the Jewish Christians in particular. And that's one of the reasons why it is a question if Paul is author or not, because he tended to write to a Gentile audience. That doesn't mean that he wouldn't necessarily write to a Jewish Christian audience. But what's significant is in the epistle of Hebrews, the writing is, is written specifically to those who were uh, followers of God before. Okay, and, and, and before what? Before Christ. That they were the chosen people, supposedly. Uh, the people that God had delivered from slavery in Egypt. The people that God had, had uh, created a nation of who had turned away from him and who had become slaves of Babylon and Assyria. And so <clears throat> I think that context is important for us because when we examine our own unbelief and our own struggle with that vine that sneaks into our life, that keeps us from living life God's way, then uh, it, can, it can become <clears throat> uh, something that we don't necessarily recognize. And we can think that we're doing well and, and that we are feeling good uh, about our lives. And the problem is that we're measuring that in an inappropriate way. All right? Some inappropriate ways might be you know, by other people how other people are living their lives, and we look at that and say, well, well, I'm a lot more righteous than this person and this person, or by maybe how our parents lived, or maybe by how other people in the church are, and, and we might look at that and say, well, man, I'm, I'm a really righteous person. I'm a really, quote, unquote, uh, good person. And so let's examine this beginning in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and they saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. And so I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. All right, so there's a, 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 a reference to an Old Testament uh, story here of the Israelites who had been delivered out of slavery God had uh, provided a way out for them. Moses led them. They crossed the Red Sea. And God had promised that there was a, a geographical place, a specific place where they would make a home. But they did not believe God. They, even though they'd seen God appear in a pillar of fire, they'd seen him part the uh, waves of the, uh, of the sea, they doubted God. They did not believe that God could create that place for them, that promised land, or what we in hindsight call the promised land. And because of that, they suffered the consequences of their own sin, of their own rebellion. And that's what he's referring to here. <clears throat> and that rest is, I think, a, a very definite parallel to what we can find in our lives today. That promised land, that place where regardless of our circumstances, regardless of how much money we make or how many good or bad things happen to us in our life, where we wake up in the morning and we are fulfilled, we are full, we desire nothing more 
than what we have. Now I want to ask you honestly, when you got up today, whether that was early or later, did you wake up and was the first thought on your mind, I have everything. There's nothing more in life I could possibly want. I'm, I'm full of joy. I'm full of life. There's nothing more that I need. I'm not upset about whatever it is I don't have. I'm not frustrated by what this person has done or hasn't done to me in my life. I am fulfilled. Was that your first thought? Is that how you awoke this morning? And see, if the answer is no, then there is, there is a contrast in your life and in my own life because I would have to confess, I, I don't believe that I could say, honestly, I woke up that way today. Some days, yes, there are certainly days, but today, probably not. And so that means there is a contrast between what it, how it is that we are to live according to God's will and according to His law and His commandments and, the, and between the, the pillars of truth that we have created or of lies that we have created in our own life. And we have to examine those two lists, if you will, or, or those two pillars and determine which way we're going to go. Because you can't go both ways. We try all the time to ride the fence and... It always ends with us falling down in one direction or the other. In verse 12, it goes on to say, Watch out, brothers, so that there won't be, any in, there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that departs from the living God. But encourage each other daily while it is still called day, so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. Just like the vine that Lucy talked about. For we have become companions of the Messiah if we hold firmly until the end the reality that we had at the start. Wow, what a rich couple verses there. Just <clears throat> fantastic. Let's examine this a little bit more closely. I know we have a lot to cover, um, but I, I want us to pause here for just a moment. So there's a caution here to watch out. Why? So that our unbelieving heart won't depart from the living God. So we have this, this sin nature, this, this unbelieving heart that desires to go its own way. And that's not necessarily all bad because we need to be separating ourselves from something. We need to be rebelling against the sin nature, but not against God. <clears throat> and that's why it can get really foggy sometimes when we start talking about life and how we should live and we start talking about the decisions that need to be made, and there's a lot of uh, controversy and discussion, and, and not every decision is so clear. Uh, it, it seems like in some situations it, are, it is, but in others it's not. And so we have to have a way to determine the path that we should go. And I think we have to recognize right away that the unbelieving part of us, the sin nature uh, that is that that we try to to bury and we try to kill off with the sword with the word of God It is constantly in conflict with the spirit and we have to be careful that we're not led astray by our by our own voice And so how can we do that by encouraging each other daily? That's how verse 13 starts While it's still called today. I think that's interesting. It creates a sense of urgency that time is running out and we won't live forever uh, we don't have forever to share the gospel with our friends, to share truth with them. That those opportunities come and go, and many of them cannot be, uh, will not come back around. And so, when that moment has passed, it is passed. <clears throat> and what else? That we would not be hardened by sin's deception. By sin's deception. Now, what does it really mean to be deceived? Well, it's like when we, <clears throat> we, uh, we go out, we're, sh we're shopping for a new product. Maybe it's a new phone, a new tractor. Uh, maybe it's uh, a new car, a new home. And <clears throat> we are marketed, right? <laughs> Especially in the Western world. Everywhere we go, there is TV commercials, radio commercials, signs, billboards, bumper stickers. I mean, in every way, people spend millions and, in fact, billions of dollars every year to market us to deceive us into thinking that their product is perfect, that their product is long-lasting and it's going to do all these amazing things. And some, co some companies are honest with their marketing and they, they, they 
accurately describe their product. But my personal experience has been that most companies uh, exaggerate, uh, to put it politely, uh, what their product can and will do for you. <coughs> and as a result of that, we are deceived. We buy that product, we get it home, and it works for a while, and then it breaks, or it wears down, or we have to replace it, or it creates even more problems for us than if we had not even gotten that item. And so we're deceived, right? We, we, we thought we were getting one thing, but we actually got another thing. And that's what happens when we go our own way. And that's why it is a fulfillment killer. Because we think, if, if I'll just go my own way, if I'll just do my own thing, and, and we, 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 we have these things that out there, when we don't realize them, we don't have them out there, we think they're going to be so great. I mean, that's, that's where the, the, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence uh, illustration comes from. <clears throat> and in fact, it's become particularly more real for me as I've realized that for a cow, green grass is a really big deal. You know, for us, it's like, well, it's nice, but, you know, so what if your neighbor's grass is greener? But when you have cows, if your neighbor's grass is greener than yours, then guess what your cows want to do? They want to go to the other side of the fence. This is a big problem. It's a bigger problem than I at once realized. And so we are deceived. We're led astray because once we then realize that grass and maybe we eat up some of that grass, it's not green anymore, and we're empty. We're left in the same state, but yet <clears throat> often we have traded away something valuable. We've lost something that's important. Let's look now at Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to fast forward push on that tape recorder, you know, back in the olden days, <clears throat> we had these things called cassette tapes, and so you would actually like push forward, and the, the tape would spin one way, and you'd push reverse, and the tape would spin another way, and then we have our kids in here with us today, so I thought I'd better explain that uh, before we get too far off, and then sometimes your tape would just tear in half, and it was a really big problem, because then you couldn't go anywhere, and I would, I would try to take the little screws out, and take the film, and tape it all up, you know, and get it to go again, but you know, it, sometimes it, it didn't work. At, at best, you'd have this little, you know, noise and stuff in the middle of your cassette. But, you know, whatever. I guess it's better than a, a DVD. Once it's scratched, you might as well just throw it away because you can't really fix it. But we're going to fast forward a little bit uh, so that we can cover a lot of ground. <clears throat> and we're going to continue examining this contrast between how God wants us to live and how the sin nature wants us to live. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Okay, so there's no question about who we're talking about, who the high priest is. Let us hold fast to the confession. Okay, that he is the high priest. All right, and this is a big deal because if you were a Jew, <clears throat> you were rejecting the earthly high priests. Okay, in favor of the high priest, Jesus. All right, so this is a big deal. It's very controversial at the time. If you, uh, from the Jewish standpoint, if you were a follower of Christ, you were the ultimate enemy. All right, there's kind of like a civil war in the Jewish faith at this point. And, and some had chosen to go one way and others had chosen to follow Jesus. And so there was this huge uh, schism that had been created and, and it was a big deal. It was a big controversy. And this statement is, is, is very in your face. It's very line defining. You know, you're, you, you, you could not really, especially at this time, be on one side of the fence uh, and the other side of the fence at the same time. It was an either or deal. You were either rejecting Christ or you were following Christ. <coughs> Going on in verse 15, so we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Now what's it referring to? In Jesus' life, what is he referring to? Right, when Jesus was, was tempted. And so it's not like, in other words, it's not like he doesn't understand where we're coming from. It's not like he's above all of that and that somehow he, he didn't, didn't have to endure the hardships of the flesh like we do. He sympathizes with that weakness, and it is a weakness. Because he was tested anyway, but the difference is that he, he did not sin in that. He was tempted, but he didn't get in, give in to it. He wasn't deceived by it. And so he demonstrated for us 
a path to righteousness, a path to fulfillment in life so that we don't have to wake up and be depressed, be discouraged, to feel empty like there's no meaning, there's no purpose in our life. <clears throat> I've, um, some of you guys may laugh at this and that's okay. <clears throat> I've been watching uh, a series and, I, and my wife very generously bought me all nine seasons. I think there's actually 10 seasons, but I can only buy nine seasons um, of Little House on the Prairie. And it's actually a fantastic series. I wholeheartedly endorse it and recommend that you watch it. It's an old show. It began in 1974, concluded in 1983. So it's got some age on it. But it is an absolutely fantastic and, and I would argue Bible-based series um, that kind of describes a little bit of what life was like in the 1870s. Right, the pioneer days, the days where we as a, a culture, as Americans, moved out into the Wild West, the great unknown, and, and colonized uh, all these places where now there are great cities, and, and, and certainly we would not consider Missouri or Kansas uh, <clears throat> or, or Texas or uh, any of the Midwest a pioneered, pioneering place at this time, but at, this, at the time in the series, it was. And um, the contrast of how people saw our nation and how they saw the world, how they saw the church compared to now is, is staggering in my mind. It is absolutely staggering. And as I, as I watch the show, which I realize is Hollywood produced and not everything is historically accurate necessarily, but <clears throat> many things are and it, it helps me understand the contrast between a culture of people, a civilization of people who choose to live by God's laws and one that has chosen to reject those laws. It's sad. It, it is tragic. <clears throat> and I want to be clear. I'm not saying it's because they chose a, a, more, a life of manual labor and, and were hard workers and, and were self-sustaining. I, I think those are important things, but I'm not basing that assessment on that. But because they chose to humble themselves and to recognize that there was a law that was greater than them. That God's law of, of loving their enemies, of, of enduring hardship, of sacrificing for others, that those were, those were great premium uh, uh, essences of who they were and of the choices that they made. And it, it made them a great nation. And my contention this afternoon is that by and large we have fallen away from that and we have rejected those principles. And because of that we are now suffering the consequences of our sin. Just exactly like the writer of Hebrews is expressing here. That that path of, of sin, of deception, it leads to destruction. And that is not God's plan for our life. In verse 16 it says, Therefore let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. And the, the most deceiving thing, I think, is if we're serious about taking this journey on or continuing on the journey, is that somehow in our own effort, we can get on that right path. But the truth is, it is only by God's grace that we arrive in that place. It is only by His mercy that we can be made right. Let's fast forward once again to chapter 5, and let's look at one of these problems and we'll try to kind of camp here and, and conclude as we discuss this problem of immaturity that the writer sees in, in the early culture, in the first century culture of Christianity, and I think very rightfully in our own uh, culture, in our own churches today, that there is this problem of immaturity that we, we hear the gospel message and we initially respond to it. And we're excited about it and we're thinking, man, I wanna, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, my life has changed and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be like all, uh, all these other people who have rejected God or who, who give lip service to it, but they live a completely different life. I'm going to be different. I'm going to do amazing things. And we're excited. And then all of a sudden we realize what the cost is. And we're like, nah, okay, maybe not. 
Let's look in verse 11 of chapter 5. We have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain. <clears throat> Since you have become too lazy to understand. Okay, well, no sugarcoating there, all right? Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk and not solid food. And now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness, because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. So the author of Hebrews calls out this dilemma, basically, that exists, that instead of maturing like, a, like they should, they get stuck at a certain level, and they can't seem to move past that. They can't seem to move forward from that. And so they are, their growth is stunted. <clears throat> we, um, uh, our calves, they, of course, drink milk, and when they get to be, you know, two to 300 pounds, they start eating, kind of experimenting with eating grass and eating hay. And, and if a calf ever couldn't make that transition off of milk, then they would be useless. You know, you take them to the sale barn, you sell them, and they can't drink any milk, and they're separated from the mom, and they're, they're going to die. You know, they're going to be starved to death. And that is what happens to us as Christians, that we starve ourselves to death. And the deception is that we don't even realize that that's happening. And I have found that <clears throat> spiritual death doesn't happen overnight. That in my life, whenever I have taken steps backwards spiritually, it's been a small step back, and a small step back, and another small step, and pretty soon I've covered a pretty significant distance. But I didn't realize that it was happening. It's just like that vine that starts growing and wrapping itself around that tree, and pretty soon it just chokes the life out of the, out of the organism. <clears throat> and it happens to us as well. And so what is one of the defining principles that lets us know if we're mature or not? Well, notice what, <clears throat> what it says here in this last verse that we just read in verse 14. It says, who has the senses that is trained to distinguish between good and evil. That, that is a great sign of spiritual maturity when we can, can distinguish between the two. Now, to distinguish it, that doesn't mean we stand off to the side and we say, well... <clears throat> This is good and this is bad, and I'm going to go for the bad. So here we go, okay? All right, so just recognizing it is, is not what is significant, but it's distinguished. It's saying, okay, this is bad, this is poisonous, this is good, this is wholesome, I'm going to go this way. And so that, that distinguishing is not this standing off and kind of intellectually assessing, which happens a lot, right? We, we, what do we do as good Baptists and pretty much every denomination of Christianity in America? What do we do? We go hide in a room, in a, in a classroom, and we sit and we talk, a, a big talk about stuff. But does it ever leave the classroom? Does it ever materialize into something good? I mean, how many amazing feats of engineering, of designs, of doing all kinds of amazing things, creating engines that can take us to other planets uh, quickly, creating vehicles that will fly us from here to there, or transporter devices that take apart our molecules and, and rematerialize them somewhere else. I mean, how many amazing designs have been created, and yet there was no follow through? They weren't materialized into anything. There was no substance that was created to make those designs become more than just intellectual. And God has a great design for our life in that same way. And he's, he's created these plans and they're, they're intricate and they're amazing to do amazing big things. And we get stuck at the design phase because we're too immature to move forward, to move past that. And we're, we're stuck drinking the milk and we don't experiment with the, the, the real food because we're afraid, because we're deceived, because we're lazy. I mean, notice how <clears throat> it starts off there. Uh, since you have become too lazy to understand. In other words, it's not because they don't have the intellectual capacity to understand. 
they just don't care. They just, they're so, they're so concerned about other things, they didn't want to move forward. And, you know, it's like in the dead of winter, you get warm and cozy by the fire or by the heater or inside, and then all of a sudden you realize you've got to go outside to do something. And, you know, it's just hard to get yourself to go out and do it, you know? Especially as you get a little bit older. I don't know, when I was a kid, I probably didn't care. I just run out in the snow and jump in it and come back inside. It didn't make any difference. But now, once I get warm and cozy and I've got my comfortable clothes on, the last thing I'm going to do is put on my coveralls and my boots and go out and feed a bell of hay or close up the chicken house or whatever. That's why my wife's favorite line about 8 o'clock is, Johnny, will you go close up the chicken house? <clears throat> because it's cold outside, you know, and we get comfortable. We don't want to go out and and do that. I've probably done that probably more times to her than she's done that to me. And so we, we become lazy in that and we don't want to exchange that. It's so much easier. I mean, what's, what's the most comfortable place? And I don't know, I, I'm probably going to get everyone in trouble. So maybe I should just say it this way. If it were me, the most comfortable place in the church would be to go sit in a nice black chair right over there and just kick back can I have my phone game going over here, maybe not off for five or ten minutes when I get sleepy, you know, and just kick back and relax. That would be great. But God calls us to not just be hearers, but to be what? Doers. Doers. That's right. And it's so important. And it's important to hear, because if we don't hear and we don't know what we're supposed to do, we're just doing random stuff, and it doesn't help anything or or serve God, but if we know the right things, and this is the problem, this is what, what is happening here in these chapters, it's not that they weren't hearing it, it's not that they didn't know what to do, it's that they weren't doing it. They were stuck, they were immature, they couldn't move forward. They couldn't distinguish between good and evil in their choices in their lives. So here it is for us. We're no different. <clears throat> Solomon told us, Nothing really ever changes under the sun. That human nature is basically the same as it was with Adam and Eve as it is now. That's why we don't or shouldn't blame personally Adam and Eve for getting thrown out of the Garden of Eden because given the opportunity, we would probably all make that same choice. But we don't have to, and that's the whole purpose of Jesus coming. That is the whole purpose of the Israelites being delivered from slavery is that we have a path out, a way out. But we can't just sit there and wait for God to do everything. We have to wait for his call. And when he calls us, when he sends us, we have to go. And it's hard and it's uncomfortable. It's just like going out <clears throat> on a cold night when it's nice and warm and cozy inside. But if we're deceived and if we stay inside and we don't go out and do it, then we will create for ourselves a small path. It's just little baby steps to spiritual death. And it will it will cause us to conclude our life unfulfilled, depressed, sad, empty. And knowing that we could have, you can come on up in that, knowing that we could have accomplished more and done great things. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, we just come this afternoon humbly. We thank you, Lord, that you have uh, spoken through your word, that we're not just creating a think tank, trying to figure it out on our own to try to understand what it is we're supposed to do on this earth. But Lord, you've told us, you've made it clear, you have taught us to distinguish good from evil. You've taught us what it is to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ, to be literally a little Christ. And so today, as we are hearers of your word, I pray that we would not be hearers only, but that we would be doers. And I pray, Lord, that <coughs> through your inspiration, through your spirit, that you would strengthen us, that you would have mercy on us, that you would give us the faith that we lack, the wisdom that we lack, to put on our coveralls, to put on our boots, our warm clothes, and to get out into the cold of night to fight against the darkness. God, I pray especially for those that are, are feeling unfulfilled in life. They feel empty. They feel cornered. They feel like everything is just a waste. It seems hopeless. And regardless of what they do, nothing can change. Nothing can get better. But we know, Lord, you have 
told us very clearly that it can and that it will if we will be faithful to seek after your ways, to not be led astray by the laws of man, by the laws of the sin nature, but to hold steadfast to your truths that you have set before us today. Your ways are perfect. Your law is perfect. Your plan for our life is perfect. <clears throat> God, I pray that today we would seek after that perfect plan and that perfect will. That we wouldn't settle for the status quo. That we wouldn't settle for average. But that we would rise up as your people, even if it's even if we, if we have to go it alone even if it's only us, and that we would walk the path that you have set out for us to walk. We just praise you, Lord. We give you the glory for every good thing in our life and ask that you would bless us and that you would cause our life to bear fruit, even if it's hard, even if it's painful, even if it requires sacrifice, and that that fruit would become a tree of life for others that that multiplicative power would continue so far that we would never be able to even track it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for being here today.